Hey friends, RESTful APIs are a popular way for interacting with services over the web, but REST is not always the best solution. GraphQL provides an alternative to REST when your primary goal is fetching data for client applications. Elizabeth is here to explain what it is and show me how it works with Azure API Management today on Azure Friday. Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman and it's Azure Friday. I'm here with Elizabeth Barnett and I'm going to learn today all about GraphQL and how it's going to help me modernize my API stack. How are you? I'm doing pretty well, Scott, excited to be here. Thanks for hanging out. Um, one of the great things I love about Azure Friday is I get to learn about things that I don't know anything about. And I know a lot about REST APIs. I could teach a class on REST, but I know about that much about GraphQL. And that's why I'm excited to hear from you because it holds a very important role in uh, web APIs right now, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of as you know, REST APIs have been the de facto API type for years and years, but GraphQL has recently come through. It's specifically made for client um, development and client applications. So whereas REST is better for backend, um, GraphQL has a lot of strengths that make it really great um, for kind of client front end development. So I have a few slides to come kind of help me explain. So um, basically, for since you're not as familiar with GraphQL, it's essentially a single call to a single endpoint. So whereas REST kind of you have to make multiple calls to multiple endpoints to serve the data you need, with GraphQL you can write specifically the data you need in one query and just make one single call and get it all back in return. And additionally, it only returns the data you need. So rather than with REST, you kind of have to parse through the information you get. You ask for kind of one thing and you get a whole block of data. Um, with GraphQL, you only get that one chunk that you're asking for. Um, and if, if I may, that's really interesting mm -hmm. because just recently, uh, Rob, my producer here on Azure Friday and I had a, a REST endpoint that we used to make a single call to and it gave us what we needed. And then it versioned, it changed. Mm -hmm. And that one call, which was a projection, I said, give me this thing in this shape. Uh, so a you know, poor person's uh, GraphQL turned into like, 400 calls and I had to go and do joins and and it was like, oh, wow, this is, REST was not made for this. So that mm -hmm. sounds like a perfect opportunity for GraphQL. Yeah, and that's exactly the problem. And GraphQL can also kind of act as a layer between your backend service and your client. So rather than kind of having to rely on the shape of a REST API or multiple REST APIs, you can kind of use this GraphQL aggregation layer um, to help aggregate those multiple endpoints into a single kind of consumable um, endpoint. That's cool. I dig it. Okay. I'm with you so far. Yeah. And kind of one last thing is that there's authorization at the field level. So um, REST, you can kind of authorize and set authorization rules at the endpoint. But with GraphQL, you can go down to the individual fields within the data and limit those um, to certain personas, certain kind of um, credentials, and it can be really powerful to help secure your data. That is really cool because I had that, that actually happened again on this project that I was mentioning where there was one field I didn't have access to, which meant the entire REST API said no, when really it could have returned everything except the thing that I, mm -hmm. uh, that I didn't have access to. Mm -hmm. So field level authorization would have been useful again. Uh, it sounds like I was, I needed GraphQL and mm -hmm. didn't even know it on this project. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I kind of have a quick example that I can run through. Um, so if we're looking at a site like just the Microsoft Store, um, there's lots of different data. There's kind of these entertainment apps. There's some utility apps. There's some ratings. There's kind of categories. Um, and then on the left side, left hand side here, there's also these categories um, with their little icons. So if we're thinking about REST, um, for this section, you kind of have a few different Git calls for the categories and the icons. Um, for this chunk of entertainment apps, you would have kind of um, a bunch for the name, some of the rating, and also the price as long as, as well as kind of all of this other information. And then for this bottom section, you'd also have all of these things with some of the same calls as well. So as you can see, that kind of starts to pile up quickly. This isn't even that complicated of a page, but as you're kind of adding these different um, sections and this different data you need, it gets really complicated really quickly and really inefficient. 
Oh, this is so true. Like with our Azure Friday API, we have to call get episode details on every episode. And then I wanted small thumbnails for some pages and larger for another. And it's a whole thing. It's a Cartesian mm -hmm. product, an explosion of a multi, you know, the multiplicity of these things. Uh, so yeah, I, I already feel the pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then let's take a look at the same page if we were to use GraphQL. Um, so this is an example of what the query could look like if you were to query for all this information. You have a few different kind of data types. You're getting the categories, but specifically only the name and the icon, so you don't have to return the whole block. And then with the apps, you're returning only the data you actually want to display on the cards. And then um, this is only one call, so you only have to make that call once, and then you have all the data you need. Okay, this is really interesting. So in... In the context of, of you know programming languages generically and REST APIs specifically, we would call this a projection. You know, I'm projecting out the objects in the shape that I want. Sounds like that's baked into the paradigm of what GraphQL is. Yeah, this is really front end developer friendly. Whereas kind of REST APIs are very much catered to the back end. GraphQL is specifically meant for the front end and makes it really easy to rapidly develop front end applications and not have to rely on kind of the shape of the back end to um, inform the shape of your front end. Yeah, that also makes me think about, you know, things like model view, view model, where mm -hmm. in this case here, the model is the view model, because that's what I asked for. I'm requesting a view model, to your point, tailored mm -hmm. to the front end. There's mm -hmm. no additional transformation that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been talking about kind of GraphQL and REST in general, um, but I kind of want to dig into how you actually implement GraphQL. Um, so there's kind of three different ways of implementing GraphQL. First is creating a server. So this would be via um, a product like Apollo or Hot Chocolate. There's a bunch of different products out there to create a server and a schema um, and kind of build that all from scratch. And then additionally, you can combine REST endpoints. So use your existing infrastructure, but then combine those into a single endpoint, kind of like I was mentioning before. And then the final kind of option is that you can create a server with new data and then augment it with data you already have. So from existing endpoints. And so that way you don't have to um, start completely from scratch. But if you want to start a GraphQL service, you can also reuse what you already have. And for all three of these, um, you kind of start with a schema. That's kind of the thing that drives a GraphQL API. And then you'll set resolvers. So with the server that's baked into the schema, whereas um, when you're kind of augmenting or combining REST endpoints, that will be something that's kind of configured after the fact. And um, then you're going to serve data. So you have to define the endpoints that's going to um, going to serve the data types and that you define in your schema. Mm -hmm. And I, But I have flexibility, right? Like I'm defining mm -hmm. the schema for all the things it could return, but the mm -hmm. the client has the, has the ultimate decision about what fields that they want and don't want, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so the schema is just every type that is possible. And then when you actually query that, um, you can set mutations to kind of edit that. You can set queries to receive only certain types. So um, you can be really specific about the fields that you want. Okay, so when just out of curiosity, you said that word mutation. Would that mean mm -hmm. like I wanted a full name field, but I had only available first and last, and a mutation would allow me to get that? Or what is the... That yeah, so mutation is actually slightly different than a query. So a mutation allows you to actually um, make a change to the data. So if you wanted to, for, some, for example, there could be a mutation that says add name, and you can add a new type or add oh. a new person. So say you wanted to add yourself into the database so people can query for your name. You could set a mutation that says um, new name, and you would add your name, first name, last name. And then mm -hmm. that way, it's into the um, actual back end, and then it can be queried. So it's just that's a way to edit. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also the third kind of type is subscription. So that actually allows you to subscribe to changes within um, the back end. So anytime a mutation is run, you can get a notification. Um, so there's some really powerful and cool stuff in there. Okay, I see. So I misunderstood then. So mutation queries modify the data mm -hmm. uh, in the data store. Okay, cool. Dig it. Yeah.
Um, so then if we talk about API management in, in particular, um, so we have kind of two different types of GraphQL support currently. So we have GraphQL pass-through, which is simply just you have an existing server and you want to put it through API management to add additional security, um, additional governance, and kind of host it along, not host it, but kind of protect it along with the rest of your APIs in a central place. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the second one is synthetic GraphQL. And that one is you don't have to have an existing GraphQL service. You can, but it's mostly just around um, you can use your existing Azure resources, um, APIs, REST endpoints, and you can aggregate those into a new GraphQL service. Um, so this can be these can be combined. So you could kind of use an existing GraphQL API, pass that through, and um, augment it with your Azure resources or REST APIs, or you can just kind of do them separately. Okay. And this is the API management as I understand it now for REST. I'm comfortable with APIM, even though as I'm learning GraphQL, the same paradigms still exist in APIM mm -hmm. around governance. So I'm still being be comfortable with mm -hmm. how APIM works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of the benefit of bringing your GraphQL services in is that you can use the same great you know, security policies, observability, um, central governance that you're used to with your REST APIs, you can expose it to consumers, um, and then you don't have to kind of start from scratch. Whereas right. if you're kind of just getting into GraphQL, um, you don't have a server yet, but you kind of want to try it out, you can just make a schema and use your existing resources with kind of little to no investment. All right, cool. I want to see a demo. Yeah, so I'm going to do kind of a demo of that augmentation thing that I was kind of mentioning. Um, so I will jump into it. Um, so here I have, this is a um, API from SpaceX. This is actually a fully um, free to use API, the GraphQL API that you can check out yourself. Mm. Um, and this is Graphical, which is actually kind of the built-in um, testing engine and discovery engine um, for documentation of GraphQL. So as you can see, you can kind of search the schema, you can look at different queries, um, and also explore mutations and subscriptions as well. This reminds so, me of like Swashbuckle and Open API mm -hmm. with REST. So mm -hmm. this is self-documenting an API. Yeah. So yeah, one of the great things about GraphQL is it's self-documenting. So built into the schema is this documentation, and then you can actually explore kind of that schema um, through documentation. And we have something similar in um, API management as well. Um, so I'm going to jump over to my API management service. I already kind of imported this API just to save some time, um, but you can click one of these buttons to either create just a normal GraphQL API, you can create a synthetic GraphQL API and upload a schema. Um, so if I jump into this API, you can see um, I can explore kind of the queries um, and the mutations and subscriptions as well, um, kind of similar to graphical. So let me see if I understand this. So you took the endpoint, that public SpaceX mm -hmm. endpoint. We do not own it or manage it. It's mm -hmm. just a public endpoint. You imported it to APIM. So now APIM can front that. So mm -hmm. then you could give me the APIM URL mm -hmm. and you're the, the, the intermediary, the middle person mm -hmm. between me and SpaceX. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So essentially this is a way to, I'm just using SpaceX as an example, but mm -hmm. any GraphQL API you have, any endpoint you can bring into API management and start to add um, some policies and just view it there and test it there. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, so if I were to kind of quickly test to make sure it's working, um, I can query for a specific capsule. So like one of the capsules from the SpaceX rockets, I'll use rockets actually, so I can return multiple. Okay. Um, so I'll take about, I'll take five of them um, and I'll see which ones are active. Um, I'll get their ID and I'll get their name. And then now I can see on the right, I have this data. So I have a few rockets. I have some active ones, some inactive ones. The Falcon Heavy is one that's kind of well known if you're kind of interested mm -hmm. in space. Um, so with just kind of being able to pass through, I can now test it and explore the schema and run test queries in API management. That's cool. I've actually been to NASA in Cape Canaveral and seen a SpaceX Falcon launch. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely okay. space nerd. Now I'm excited about that particular endpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then at this point you can add rate limiting, you can do anything that you mm -hmm. want, any, any API management. That's what APIM mm -hmm. is all about. You now have total control. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, so I could add a rate limit policy, um, but we also have um, a validate GraphQL request policy that's brand new for um, GraphQL API specifically. Um, and I've already kind of added this one in here already. Um, so we have two different things you can kind of validate. You can re um, restrict the maximum size of the query. So you can kind of prevent really complex queries from coming in and um, giving denial, denial of service attacks on your endpoint and your backends um, by kind of reducing the size and the complexity of the um, query that you're actually getting. And then the second one is depth, which also relates to kind of complexity. So as you can see in GraphQL, there's kind of different levels of fields. So the depth kind of um, restricts how deep you can go. So how many you know, <laughs> fields can you go deep into the right. um, GraphQL schema. Details and sub details. Mm -hmm. And then you, when you clicked and switched from that design view into this XML, mm -hmm. you can go back and forth mm -hmm. between the mm -hmm. front of the card and the back of the card. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, currently there are some other policies that like rate limit, you can kind of apply with a low code version. Um, the GraphQL validation policy isn't currently available in that format but that is something we're working towards to kind of make it more available. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously XML is not always the most friendly. <laughs> That's um, what the young people say, but I like it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear. Um, so yeah, as you can see, um, I kind of have the max size and the max depth. And I also have this authorization chunk. So um, this authorization block is kind of that, what I was talking about earlier. Um, and this first one, it will actually reject any um, introspection query. So if you're kind of looking at the schema and trying to kind of learn more about the schema, that can be a way to kind of have data leakage. If someone who's not supposed to be seeing this data is able to kind of explore um, the schema and figure out what fields are there. Um, and then the second one is just for a specific path, kind of um, removing some, removing the data for missions if there's too many headers. So, okay, cool. yeah, so just a simple example. Um, so I'm actually going to kind of give an example. I'll test out this max depth one for you. Um, I'll do max size and max depth. So if I were to make it really small. <laughs> and so I'm making, this is just making, making the max size 10 bits um, or 10 bytes. Units, 10 items, right? 10, <laughs> 10, 10, 10, 10 records. 10 <laughs> so, um, and then I'm making the depth three. So if I save that, All right. um, I can go back over and test. So I can make a really large um, query. And then when I get the response, I get the request body is 142 bytes long and it exceeds the configured limit of 10 bytes. Oh, you literally meant 10 bytes. Yeah, so I made a really small, so easy example to oh, <laughs> show. Oh, I see. Um, but it's totally customizable. You can make it as large or small as you want. Um, and yeah, so um, that's kind of an example of part of the policy in action. Um, I don't want to jump through all of them because in the interest of time, but. Sure, sure. Um, uh, so there's a lot of different policies you can do with GraphQL APIs and API management. Um, for the interest of time, maybe you just jump into one more. Uh, is there one in particular interested in? Well, so we had talked about how GraphQL is kind of a projection, right? You can aggregate multiple endpoints and and, and project out uh, the shape of what you want. Mm -hmm. You have fronted the SpaceX API, but what if I wanted to add something to it? Like mm -hmm. I want to like, they have everything I want, except a couple of things that I can get mm -hmm. from another place. Can I fake it? Yeah, for sure. So let's kind of jump into that synthetic GraphQL um, that I was mentioning before. Um, so the first thing I want to do is make sure that my um, schema actually has this extra field. Um, so if I actually go back, if I go to here, I have this logic app that will return photos of the rockets um, in the SpaceX portfolio. Um, so it's this logic app. It goes to a Azure storage blob, and it gets the blob content. Specifically, this one is getting the Falcon Heavy um, image. So um, this is the logic app that I'm going to be using, and I want to kind of aggregate my existing GraphQL API with. So if I go back, um, 
Now I can go um, to the schema and I can go down to rocket and make sure that I have this field that I want. This is that photo that we want. Um, so we're adding it to the schema to make sure that when we make a query, um, it'll be able to be fetched. Um, so now I'm saving. And now what I can do is I can go to the back end section and before the base, so before it actually goes to the back end, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to set this resolver. So on the type rocket, um, I'm going to add this field photo just like I did in the schema. And mm -hmm. I'm setting the method to post to set it to call this logic app. So it's calling the logic app that's um, in API management. So it's calling this photo slash manual slash pass slash invoke. Um, and if I save that, then I can go over to test. And if I wanted to get this rocket, get this Falcon Heavy and make sure I'll get the name and the photo. Okay, the name comes from SpaceX, the photo comes yeah. from your backend. Yeah. So here on the right, we have this data that's coming from the SpaceX backend and then this photo that is this URL that I defined mm -hmm. from my logic app. And then if I go to a new tab, enter this, I see I have this lovely photo of a SpaceX rocket. It's the Falcon Heavy rocket. Um, so it's just kind of one extra policy. Um, I was able to add an additional field and a different additional data type. So you can see as you can kind of continue to add um, some more, then you kind of can really expand your, your back end and your existing GraphQL API. Interesting. This might be a little bit of an obscure question, but I noticed that you put it ahead of base and you made a comment mm -hmm. about that, that you're putting it mm -hmm. before, kind of thinking about object-oriented programming mm -hmm. where you have like your, your subclass mm -hmm. and your superclass. Yeah. Is that happening simultaneous or does it happen syn you know, synchronously one after the other? Yeah, so it does happen one after the other. So because um, you want it to be kind of called before the base, you're going to want to have it beforehand so that before you actually go to that existing SpaceX backend, you're going to want to also fetch this data as well. I see. Um, so, because otherwise it would just be kind of the existing data. Um, and oh, one thing, okay. Yeah. And one thing I didn't mention is, um, and that kind of isn't built into this API, but we also do have support for some GraphQL subscriptions. Um, so, subscriptions to, to subscribe to changes to the data, changes to the back end. Um, we support currently just um, subscriptions over WebSockets. Um, so, if you're existing GraphQL service has that format, um, then you're able to also add a subscription and um, test those and all of the above in the Azure portal. Interesting. So could, this is totally random, but could mm -hmm. I like make it to like gold, silver, and platinum and only platinum people get the photo and like mm -hmm. regular people. So like the, the more subscriptions you have, the more fields you have, like I can do anything with APIM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You can add a bunch of new mutations, you can use the existing subscriptions. Sure, but sure. Um, yeah, you can add queries, you can add mutations, add new types. Um, yeah. That's cool. Wow. All right. This is very cool. I'm going to have to go re rethink some of my REST APIs and consider where GraphQL and APIM might fit in more, more appropriately with what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, I'm here for all your questions. All right. And where can people go to learn even more? Yeah, so we have this site. Um, it's aka.ms slash apimlove. Um, so this is just our library of all resources. There's also um, a specific section for GraphQL resources. So that's a direct link to um, our documentation on importing, about um, setting up resolvers for synthetic, and kind of a bunch of other external resources like the GraphQL Foundation, um, which is the open source kind of manager and um, kind of something that Microsoft's actually a part of for um, kind of creating the guidelines for GraphQL. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, maybe I'll get you to add uh, some links to Azure Friday APIM videos as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Fantastic. I am learning all about API management and GraphQL today on Azure Friday. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Azure Friday. Now I need you to like it, comment on it, tell your friends, retweet it, watch more Azure Friday.